Okay. Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to the latest in our webinar series. Um, so we're, we're helping, our aim is to help researchers and practitioners share knowledge and experience about uh, NFM. Hi, I'm Gerard Stewart. I'm the communications coordinator for the research programme. And today we have uh, Professor Tim Allett and Dr Emma Shuttleworth, who are um, from part of the Protect NFM project, part of the three, well, one of the three projects that make up the uh, research programme and that they're going to present on peatland catchments and natural flood management. Unfortunately, Emma isn't feeling 100% today, so Tim's going to be presenting, but Emma will be on the chat and um, answering uh, questions. So she, 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 is, she is here. Um, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping points and briefly describe the programme before I hand over to uh, Tim. So first of all, please keep your <coughs> microphones muted and to avoid background noise. And um, please do ask questions and make comments in using the chat function. Um, we've had some lively uh, conversations going on during the webinar um, and yeah, do respond to other people's comments uh, if you see fit. So yeah, please do use that. Um, I've got to tell you, we are recording the webinar, one for GDPR uh, purposes, but also um, it, we're, we're going to make it available on our website alongside the other recordings of previous webinars. Um, so if you if you want to listen again or share it with uh, people who haven't been able to make it, um, please do. So uh, briefly, the the, the research program um, it's a four year program um, funded by uh, NERC and our aim is to carry out um, novel, um, we're carrying out novel science um, to improve our understanding of natural flood management uh, where possible using quantification. Um, we're looking at a range of NFM measures in different types of catchments, flooding scenarios and at different scales and our goal is to improve um, the evidence and understanding for policymakers and practitioners. As I said, there's there's three projects that make up the program, and today we're going to hear from the some of the Protect team. Um, it's it, we are working with a, a really wide range of partners, um, and there's a, a quick summary to give you a flavour of of those. And in the spirit of partnership this is really what the web, web the webinar program is about um sharing sharing our knowledge and experience and taking on um the uh, views and ideas of of others as as we develop the the research um so without further ado i'll, I'll hand over to tim Okay, so I will share my screen and Jared, if you could confirm when that's that's up, yeah, that's, up. that's great. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'll get my excuses in early. Um, Emma's dodgy voice means that um, I'm um, giving the whole of the the uh, presentation today. So if I'm less than slick with one or two of these slides, I'm sure you'll you'll forgive me. And apology number two is if if there's a sudden mad barking noise, it's because our cocker spaniel realizes the postman's near. So. Um, apologies if if there's a little bit of uh, a barking halfway through. It tends to do it when I'm giving big presentations like this. Um, so our presentation today is about a piece of work. It's largely um, about a piece of work that we completed last year as part of the IUCN peatland programs um, inquiry, commission of inquiry on peatland. So for those that don't know, the IUCN peatland program is very um, very vigorous program of research and practitioner advice on, on, on peatland and peatland management and they have a commission of inquiry they're updating that and last year they commissioned a series of reports on peatlands uh, in the UK and this is one of those reports um, and it's not just Emma and I that completed it there were 13 uh, co-authors from academic and practitioner backgrounds we also had a 
a workshop um, in Manchester where about 30 additional um, policy practitioner and academic partners came and, and contributed. And it's a review really of the, the state of understanding uh, that we currently have about um, Peter Catchments and, and NFM. So that's what I'm going to summarise today. Um, and the aims of the of the uh, report were really to look at the scientific understanding of the effects of peatland restoration. So there's a, an emphasis here on peatland restoration um, and, and, and the evidence base for um, water regulation from uh, peatland re uh, uh, restoration. There was a, an earlier report, particularly on water quality issues. So this report was very much about water quantity regulation with a strong emphasis on river flow regimes and, and high flow events um, so I mean this is a you know this definition probably gets put up in all of these webinars about uh, natural flood management and NERC's definition of that the reason for me showing this is to, is, is, is to put the emphasis on restoration because um, there are other forms of NFM about emulating natural regulating functions by forms of catchment engineering and so on but there's a large emphasis on this definition on on restoration and restoring natural functions. And of course, in the peatlands, it's the restoration of, of the peatlands that has generated a lot of interest in the extent to which that can lead to natural flood management benefits uh, downstream. Um, and um, upland peatlands are really important in the UK. Again, the emphasis in, on today's presentation in the report is on upland peatlands. There are, there are reasons for that. Um, but peat forming landscapes as a whole cover about 10% of the, of, the, of the UK land cover and 60% of the uplands. So catchments that uh, adjoin the uplands have uh, a strong influence from peat and peaty soils. And they're highly productive of runoff. Um, you know, high high uh, runoff coefficients, large proportion of the rainfall that falls on, on peatlands runs off relatively rapidly. So they're very responsive, flashy systems. Um, relatively flood prone in terms of high flows from, from rainfall events. And the crucial factor is that relatively few of uh, the UK's peatlands are in a natural state. Um, there's been a, a large amount of degradation of, of UK peatlands, a large proportion to a greater or, or, or lesser degree, and across the whole of the UK as well. I mean, some of the most um, severe degradation is in, is in, um, in the Pennines, but this this image here is is from North yes, Wales okay. um, and of, of bare peat, and as as, as, as well as as, as, that, as that form of degradation, kind of erosion um, from different causations. There's also been a strong history of management of these peatlands, and this is just an example of, of, of land drainage of the peatlands, which um, for agricultural use. So 80% of our peatlands in some way have been uh, modified or degraded or, or damaged. And that's led to um, programmes of peatland restoration and very large uh, investment and, and accelerating investment in peatland restoration. So, I mean, the Scottish, you know, earlier this year, the Scottish uh, government, for instance, announced a huge funding campaign for, for peatland restoration, um, £20 million in the budget for 2020-21. Um, and that's you know, um, just a signal of the, uh, of, a, of a sort of level investment that's going into peatland restoration. And a lot of that's for, for multiple benefits. It's, it's a lot of peatland restoration uh, initially was really based on uh, concerns about biodiversity and erosion. Then the, um, the importance of, of, of peatlands as carbon stores became, became apparent. And then more recently, uh, over the last 10 years or so, water regulation functions of peatlands with water quantity issues and NFM has become um, more established. And I told you Bracken would, would start barking uh, when the postman arrived, and there it goes. So, peatlands are connected, or a lot of peatlands are connected to uh, assets or communities at risk of, of flooding. And that varies depending on where you are in, in, the, in the country. But this is just a little study to, to illustrate that and to illustrate the close connection between, between um, 
peatland soils and peatland uh, systems and where flooding matters. So this is this is actually where I'm sat. I'm currently almost exactly on that spot there. This is Glossop in the Peak District, and it's one of a set of catchments across uh, the Greater Manchester, Cheshire region, EA region, which are the focus of, of study at the moment, communities at risk of, of flooding. And you can see from the, the soils map there that the, the headwaters of, of the Glossop catchment are dominated by uh, peaty soils. They're dominated by um, and with large areas of deep peat as well as as well as shallow peat. Um, and this is not unique uh, by any means. So if you look at the data from this, this little case study, uh, of those 22 catchments at risk, a very large number of properties are at risk of flooding. And of those, um, many of them are in catchments with high proportions of peat in the in the headwaters. So um, if you just take you know, a strict definition of deep peat, nearly 2,000 properties at risk in this area are in catchments where deep peat is, is more than 25% of the catchment. And the other important thing about, about these, this sort of study is it, it demonstrates that um, peatlands can be important in small catchments. Now, small in the, in the sense of, of um, the Dabson Review, 20, uh, that says 2007, sorry, the 2017 Dabson Review, which talked about the evidence we have for NFM and, and how effective NFM is, and um, that it's in small catchments where uh, we have the most the strongest evidence that NFM is 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 effective. Well, some of these people in catchments we're talking about are small. Um, it's not just the, the larger catchments. So these are the catchments in which you would expect to see perhaps the the, the most effective um, uh, impacts of NFM, and we have large amounts of peatland in them. Now, this is one study. It's different in different areas uh, of the UK uh, in terms of the proportions and the, but it demonstrates how how this kind of analysis can actually help target uh, and demonstrate catchments where you have both community risk of flooding and high um, high, high uh, areas of peatland. Well, I think it's true to say that there's been. Um, there's, there's kind of a, 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 a gradient of com of confidence about the extent to which peatland restoration will uh, help alleviate downstream flooding. Um, and here's just a couple of quotes to sort of illustrate the, the opposite ends of that gradient of confidence. So uh, there's, a, there's a quote there from the CEO of a wildlife trust at a meeting I attended last year, who's very confident based on their understanding and, and the evidence that they looked at that peat restoration can reduce flooding. And then the second quote there is, um, it's not, you know, it's not confidence, but it's, it demonstrates the barrier of demonstration that we have to we have to meet to be able to to convince about, um, you know, investment. This investment will will have an effect because if you're a flood risk manager, you you want and you want to invest further in in NFM measures, for instance, in 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 peatland restoration. You want to have much clearer information on the benefit you're going to get in terms of flood peaks for uh, events of, of large events with particular return periods and at a scale of catchment that that that, that matters downstream communities at risk and how much it's going to cost to do that so in terms of our understanding of peatland restoration and nfm where are we at the moment on this gradient of of understandings how confident are we that that these NFM, so these, these these restoration measures will have a meaningful effect, um, and that's partly what this review was about. It was about a snapshot approach, literature review, largely with bringing in expert advice as well on uh, establishing our understandings, our current understandings of NFM in, in peatland catchments, um, and some of that's based on. Um, literature on, on processes, hydrological processes in peatlands and, and what they infer and what we can, um, our understandings about NFM from that. And some of it's about the evidence base, the direct evidence base of uh, the different types of uh, peatland restoration and what information and evidence we have that that alters the hydrology and it can have uh, a, reduce, a reduce peat flows from the peatland areas and then have a meaningful downstream effect. And then we also looked at the evidence gaps um, and, and, and made some recommendations for, for key research that needed to be done. So that's what the, 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 the review entailed. And, and uh, I'm now going to try and summarise some, some of the findings of the review. 
So there is a strong conceptual basis for an FNMP in catchments. This is the, the idea, and again, this is quite familiar to those who've who've been attending these webinars and, and anyone who's, who's, who's working and, and looking at NFM, you'll be aware of this. But the concept here is we've got areas of degraded peat and they take up a uh, significant proportion of the catchments that you're interested in, where there's a community at risk, and that by uh, restoring that, that peat in some way, by restoring the hydrological function, you reduce uh, peat flows, you maybe delay peat flows from, from those areas of the, of the wider catchment, enough to make a difference downstream, a meaningful difference downstream. Um, and there is a process basis for this, based on our, our kind of um, the, the, the accumulated uh, work on peat hydrology over the years and our understanding about how runoff is generated from, from peatlands. And, you know, to simplify it, there's, there's really two main process controls that can, uh, that could contribute to, to peat flow reduction. The first is ways in which the peatland uh, and after restoration can store more water um, during storm events. So within a storm event, um, holding back uh, the, the water so that it doesn't pass through the system. Um, and that could come from increased evapotranspiration. So this is just an example of um, a, a revegetated system. And once you introduce vegetation, that that transpires. So you you um, even even during storm events, you might lose water through transpiration. You might get local ponding effects. You might get interception. So there are ways in which uh, restoration you would expect it to to increase within storm storage. But the other really important process is uh, concerned with delaying the conveyance of the of the flow. So in a system like this one, when you establish a vegetation cover, that um, increases the surface roughness of the landscape. If you have um, uh, bare peat, as in this instance, it's a, a smooth landscape and you have much more rapid conveyance of the water because of lower roughness. Given the fact that in peatlands, the uh, um, storm flow is dominated by overland flow, in particular by um, saturation excess overland flow. So the water table fills up, it starts to rain, the water table fills up and water starts moving across the surface of the landscape. So the surface condition is very important here, and in that case, you can get um, reduced uh, uh, velocities of overland flow, um, longer uh, travel times of the water into channels, um, and and that means that you get a in, in that um, process, you don't actually necessarily change the amount of water leaving the the uplands uh, in a storm event, but you delay the. The, you, you delay the, the release of it. So you get the same amount of water coming out, but it comes out later, and that attenuates the, the, the hydrograph, and you get reduced flow and an increased lag time as well. Whereas a storage effect, you may get uh, a similar response time, but you, you have less, less, um, less uh, peak flow. So as I say, anyone who's, who's been involved in NFM knows this, you know, knows these ideas, but it's worth just um, um, rehearsing them for, for, for this audience. So there's been a, a, a series of different types of intervention in peatlands under, under restoration. Um, from the restoration of, of bare peat that I've already alluded to already, to the introduction of, of uh, vegetation types that have been lost, in particular sphagnum moss. Uh, these are plug plants of sphagnum being introduced to, to, to um, uh, a peatland. Um, through to, and they, they treat surface conditions, but there's also um, peel restoration techniques that deal with um, grips, um, the drainage ditches that have been dug in a lot of peatland systems, or the gullies that are formed in uh, a lot of the uplands as well. Um, and there's also, uh, probably more recently, a lot of interest in uh, forested peatlands um, particularly in Scotland, actually, with a lot of the commercial forestry on areas such as the flow country in the far northwest, north northeast of Scotland, um, removing the forest, returning it to, to uh, a pre-forestation state and restoring those forests. And then the other, the other topic that we're going to cover quickly, and we have to go through these relatively quickly, is uh, moorland burning. Um, through wildfire and through um, prescribed managed burn as well. This is a real severe wildfire above 
and showing the, the condition of the peatland after a really severe wildfire. Um, and what happens after that burning? If you restore following a big wildfire or there is recovery, what happens to the runoff generation? What happens to NFM potential? So I'm going to run through these, the evidence base, I'm going to run through these different interventions in a moment or two and just tell you what the evidence suggests about NFM effects of these different, of these different interventions. Um, but first, it's worthwhile spending a, a moment or two just thinking about the nature of the evidence base that we have for uh, natural flood management effects of, of peel and restoration. Um, I've already alluded to the fact that we have you know, quite a wide literature, quite a lot of studies over the, over the years. So we understand the principal uh, processes that generate runoff in peatland systems. Um, and that process understanding you know, by, by inference and also from plot scale studies and, and so on, that can tell us an awful lot about the expectations and the hypotheses about the way different interventions might, might behave in terms, of, um, in terms of flooding downstream, in terms of um, peat flow reductions. But the most useful studies to us are those that deal with a catchment scale. So you're integrating the runoff processes at a catchment scale. Um, preferably, we'd like that for the, the scale of um, community at risk and so on. We often have smaller catchment scale. But the key thing here is we'd like studies that, that tell us about the way hydrographs change um, at a catchment scale with these sorts of interventions and with the kind of growing so, um, the growing investment in in, in um, peat restoration over the last decade we've had an increased number of studies of this type catchment scale studies looking at the way in which hydrograph uh, form changes after peat and restoration interventions um, as in fact the, the table here which you can't I've always put in a table that no one can read that's uh, an old trick. The, the, the reason for putting this there is that this is a summary table in the report, which if you have a look at the report uh, outside of this, you can you can see. And it's just a summary of 10 different really key studies that we've uh, taken place over the last few years on these sorts of catchment scale assessments. And there's a number of features of those studies, um, which are probably important to recognise. Some of them are field-based studies. So where we've got direct measurement, direct monitoring of changing hydrographs with different sorts of intervention. But quite a lot of them are model, model exercises, modeling exercises. And, and that's partly a scale issue because field experimentation or, or measurement of NFM effects from restoration um, from observation, you can do it at a relatively small scale. As you increase the scale, it gets increasingly complex because there are the factors, other types of uh, land use, other types of change taking place in catchments. So it's difficult to isolate the effect of, of NFM. So the, so the studies that have been done so far at a, at a larger catchment scale tend to have been modeling studies. The field studies tend to be based on, on really small catchments and catchments that, that are, are, are not at the scale um, of, of catchments at, at risk, certainly. The other, the, other, um, the other feature that I've pointed out here is that quite a lot of these studies have been about drain blocking, which has been uh, uh, you know, drainage and blocking of drainage restoration. A lot of interest in that. Um, and six of them have been about changes in, in peat surface cover, either bare peat uh, restoration or, or, um, or uh, um, uh, sphagnum reintroduction. So they're kind of, they're not evenly distributed across the types of restoration that we have. We don't have these catchment scale assessments for all of the types of restoration that are, that are going on. So let's have a look at some of these in a bit more detail. Um, so some of the first restoration has, was based on revegetation of bare peat. They're really severely degraded systems where um, large areas of bare peat were, were exposed and it's logical that they are the first places that you might look to, to, to restore. And we have a few studies of those, um, which are different types of studies. We've got studies at plot scale, we've got studies at catchment monitoring, we've done some modelling work and they've been replicated in different areas as well. And we've got pretty high confidence um, that um, you get really significant delays and reductions in peat flow out of the headwater catchments when you revegetate the bare peat. 
Um, so this is data from uh, Anna's paper from last year, from uh, the Peak District, showing that this sort of bare peat um, green vegetation reduces peat flows by about 30% and, and doubles the lag time coming out of these experimental catchments. And the key control here is um, reductions in overland flow velocity. It's this surface roughness effect, slowing the flow, reducing the, the rapidity of water moving through the catchment. And that's, so we understand, we've got good understanding, although, you know, we, there are other studies going on and we, we're refining that all the time, but we have good understanding and confidence that at the headwater scale, we can reduce um, the peat flows coming out of these headwater catchments by revegetation of their peat. A lot of investment going on at the moment in the planting of sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss is the, the bog builder. It's a crucial keystone species in, in blanket peats. And it's missing or, or, or really denuded in large areas of, of upland UK, in particular in England, in the Pennines, for example, in the South Pennines, sphagnum was disappeared, almost entirely disappeared due to air pollution. Um, and through the North Pennines as well, it's similar issues. There's, there's areas that had that we would expect to have um, large areas of sphagnum that don't. So a lot of pillar restoration projects concentrating at the moment on trying to reintroduce sphagnum moss to these, these areas. Um, and plug plants, so you can put in a plug plant and uh, they, they take, and if you leave it long enough, you get these sort of sphagnum lawns appearing here. Um, uh, and this is an experimental site, a part of the most of the future's more life work. And you can see the areas of sphagnum, the pale colours, these are areas of sphagnum where they've, they've um, really accelerated the, the spread of the sphagnum by a lot of plug plants, um, much, much higher densities than you would do normally. Um, and it has, and it has um, spread really nicely. And in theory, at least, that should have a significant effect on, on runoff processes, again, through this... Uh, increase surface roughness effect. So some very nice work done um, on plot scale experiments by Joe Holden and the group at Leeds, which demonstrated that this is the line for sphagnum, this is the velocity of the water and, and, and flow depth, and you get lower velocities of the water running over sphagnum than other peak cover types. Um, and if you upscale that using, using, using models, um, this is Gauss work, and I'll refer to this a, a, a little while later as well, you see reductions in, in, in flood peaks at larger catchment, catchment scales. So there's the potential here for really um, substantial changes in, in peak flow production from the uplands if we re-establish sphagnum covers on a, on a large enough basis. Um, word of caution, as yet, that hasn't been demonstrated by monitoring at a catchment scale. Although again, that, is, that, that work is on, ongoing as part of Protect and one or two other projects as well. Um, but um, promise from, from sphagnum um, reintroduction. Now drain blocking, a lot of attention on, on drain blocking, large efforts going into um, putting in, uh, using, often using, using diggers, either peat dams, so this is a, 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 a grip, a, a drain that's been blocked with peat dams, and you get these pools behind them, and then, um, and, um, Quite a lot of work being done on what that means for runoff generation and peak flows. And the, um, on the one hand, when you, you look at that data, it can be a little bit contradictory because generally speaking, the field studies that have been done report decreased peak flows. But some of the modelling studies that have been done suggest that you could actually get increases in peak flow associated with, with um, grip blocking, drain blocking. But if you look in a little bit more detail at the, that data, it can resolve itself because um, the effect that you get is uh, a function of the orientation and the density and the nature of the drainage network and the drain network. So this is from this is a study from Mignine in Wales. These drains were orientated down the slope, and if you block down slope drains, it diverts water onto the, the hill slopes. And that uh, increases travel time. You get the you get more attenuation, and therefore you see a reduction. Um, there's evidence that you see a reduction in, in peak flows out of these systems. 
the modeling studies demonstrate if you if, if you there are there are uh, drainage systems that go across the slope and in those cases there is a possibility that if you block the drains you will actually um, shorten the travel time of the water by diverting the water onto the hill slope in some cases it travels uh, a shorter distance and therefore gets into the into the channels more quickly so there is a sort of theoretical possibility that that you could you could exacerbate peak flows that's not been demonstrated yet from, from field studies but the take-home message is that different sites with different geographies of drainage might be expected to behave differently to restoration practices and so site-based assessments and, and the proper tools to be able to do that are going to be required uh, if we're able to sort of reliably predict how a site will respond to uh, drain blocking. This is gully blocking. Um, gullies are very extensive in the UK's blanket peatlands. Uh, you know, across the whole, wherever there are blanket peatlands, almost without exception, there have been uh, the formation of, of uh, gullies, which are effectively extensions of the drainage network. They increase the drainage density. Um, and so, uh, by inference, they, they increase the uh, transmission of water through the system and increase, increase peak flows. Um, coming through them. A lot of emphasis now on gully blocking in these uh, systems and it's happening in, it's been happening for a while where in the South Pennines with um, conservation agencies in North of the future, um, happening elsewhere in the, the UK as well and at scale. So North of the future have got um, a project called Building Blocks where they're um, accelerating the, the, the gully blocking efforts here. I think there's about 8,000 gully blocks going to go in between now and the end of March this year, and then ambitions to, to scale that up into the future. And gully blocks originally were designed to trap sediment to help stabilise uh, the peatlands, to help um, accelerate revegetation. But there is an NF, potential NFM benefit. If you this is, these are stone blocks that we've done most work on, and uh, they are uh, permeable, so they form, when they first go in certainly, they form a dynamic storage in, in storms. They, they'll fill with, with, with water when, when the storm passes through and then they'll drain away. Um, and they also have potentially an attenuation effect by just the, the, um, the presence of these stone, stone blocks. Um, that, that creates roughness on, in the channel and can, can attenuate flow. Um, and we have seen in, in the, the data that's available so far, which has been on gully blocking, which has been on these stone downs, um, that there is uh, data suggesting that they have a, 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 a they reduce uh, peak flows, particularly at the small catchment scale, at the micro catchment scale that, that the studies have been done so far. Um, However, there are different types of gully blocking as well. So these are peat dams, um, again done with the digger, um, uh, which are more analogous to drain blocks, although these are downstream orientated, downslope orientated systems, of course. Um, and these are wooden blocks, uh, impermeable wooden blocks that, that are filled here with, with pools. So these systems are like expected to behave a little bit differently. So we have some evidence already from gully blocking that, that you can reduce peak flows with gully blocking, but not for all gully block types and fuller quantification of that is, is needed, more experimentation is needed. Now I said already a lot of emphasis in Scotland at the moment on uh, restoring a forest to peats. This is, I think this is from the flow country here within a, a forest on this side and this scenario being restored on the right hand side. Um, and um, hydrological effects of afforestation on peatlands, they are complex. Um, so uh, Tom Nisbet, who may well be sitting in on this, he's giving a, a, a seminar, a webinar on this series later on in, in the year, will tell you how complex these effects can be. And in a, in a forest of peatlands, there's an added layer of complexity because you also have drainage to, to plant the, the forest, you, you, you drain them. So, um, so there's a there are fact there are controls in different directions here on, on, on peak flows. We know that forest cover can reduce uh, flood peaks. We know that the greatest impact, well, we, the evidence is that the greatest impact on that is on small and medium flood peaks. Tom will review that data, no doubt, in his 
in his in his um, in his seminar. Um, but how that plays out in in uh, restored systems where you've also got drain blocking going to take place um, is is a certain amount of uncertainty. Although current understanding suggests that removal of forest cover from peatlands does have the potential to increase flood peaks because you lose the the effects of that forest cover in terms of uh, storage of water and potentially attenuation of water flow uh, through the system. So the current advice um, uh, associated with forest practice is that you need to be quite careful about if you're restoring some of these systems, you need to be quite careful about the proportion of uh, catchment at risk of flooding that you, you restore in the first instance. But more work is needed on this. We, we have really very little data at a catchment scale of the impacts of this sort of restoration on runoff and, and peak flows. And another issue that's obviously of, of great interest and concern is the impacts of the burning of peatlands on, on runoff. Um, and these are just some images. This is the big fire at Staley Bridge um, two years ago. And that's what it looked like afterwards. This is, this is a shallow peatland that was really um, it's not the deep peat area, which which uh, wasn't anything like as badly affected. This is sort of worst affected area of that on the shallow peatland. Um, but we've also got managed burn as well, and there's concern about uh, the impacts of managed burn on um, on runoff generation and and peat flows. The current sort of process based understanding is that if you have severely burnt peatlands and you get areas of bare ground uh, exposed that will lead to flashy hydrographs and higher peak flows. So severe fire across, across large areas, um, the effects of, of peak flow could be on peak flow could be really quite substantial. But that's really largely based on process understanding and um, and uh, plot studies and so on. We don't really have, we have remarkably, given the scale of importance of the, of the issue, we have remarkably little data on the impacts of peatland burning at a catchment scale, at a, at a, you know, in terms of hydrographs before and afterwards, or hydrographs from areas that are burnt and, and non-burnt. The kind of one exception to that is the is the Ember study that was done a few years ago by the University of Leeds. Um, but even that wasn't very conclusive because what they did there is they compared uh, catchments that were burnt with a set of catchments that were that were uh, unburnt but not burnt, um, and they did conclude that they could see slightly uh, higher peak flows in the uh, non-burnt catchments but they were quite clear in that report that that was not conclusive and that's because the research design was a spatial comparison and there are other uh, catchment factors drainage densities uh, orientations the catchment slopes and so on that can actually influence the, the hydrograph so they weren't controlling for that and they were quite clear about that so one of the outcomes of the review was, was in fact, how we, we got a, there's a lot of process information on, on the potential impacts of burning on peatlands, but we don't have a lot of really hard uh, catchment scale uh, information on this, um, perhaps surprisingly. So this is just trying to draw that together a little bit, simple table showing the sort of direction of the impacts of the different restoration measures based on uh, our best available understandings. Um, um, with you know commercial forestry, we if you take that away, there's a possibility of uh, you know concern yeah, about yeah. Increasing, increasing flows. But um, the other um, the other measures all have the potential at least to to uh, reduce peak flows. Um, but with the important proviso in ditch blocking, there's an important site specific um, control on that. Um, this is roughly in the kind of order of confidence that we have in the in the in these findings from um, revegetation peat flow, which they're most confident about uh, uh, about that really. And it's and unsurprisingly, it's also in the order that we probably have the most to the least amount of information uh, on as well. So one of the kind of key messages from from uh, the review was that there is increasing evidence that that um, it's site specific. It's not. Uh, it's a generalisation, but peat restoration can alter catchment runoff regimes um, and reduce peat flows at the small catchment scale, and that is 
consistent with the, you know, not surprisingly, with the Dabson review from a couple of years ago about the kind of scale um, over which these interventions um, have shown to be effective. But the review also identified a few key um, knowledge gaps. So, first of all, there are, as I hope we've, we've demonstrated, there are several really important types of restoration that we have limited data on, limited empirical data or limited limited assessments of. And so there's there's those gaps need to be filled. We need to understand more about some of these some of these interventions um, than we do. The second key knowledge gap is that is that there's an assumption here that just the intervention just turns on and is effective, but that's not how restoration works. Some of these interventions are progressive in terms of the effects they have, um, and and the and the the way they alter hydrological processes may change through time. And a lot of the studies that have been done so far have been on short time scales. And really, we need to know about uh, how these effects are going to evolve over time. And the third um, real key knowledge gap, and again, it won't be a surprise to anyone who's involved in the, in the NFM community, is that a lot of the work that's been done so far has been at small scale, um, because it's uh, by necessity about the scales in which you can do the interventions on and, 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 and monitor them. And also they're over short time periods. So the chances of, of having a really high return period flood during the monitoring period are, are, are restricted. So. We need to make the, the 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 leap up to larger scales. We need to be able to 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 make uh, quantitative assessments for flood relevant flood relevant scales for communities at risk or assets at risk, and for a fuller range of flood return periods than we've, we've done so far. So let me tell you a little bit about about those. Uh, Gerald, how am I doing for time? How long have I got left? Um, um, yeah, two, two two or three minutes. Okay, yeah. so I'll three minutes, three, but yeah. So um, the timescales issue, you know, sphagnum is, is one. So how long is it going to take sphagnum to create lawns like this? Over what timescales is that going to have an impact? Is it, is it decades? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Is it 20 years? Well, you know, how long is it going to take? Um, so that might be a delayed, delayed benefit. But there are other changes as well. So these are gully blocks and these are maturing gully blocks. This is what it's like when you start. And this is what it looks like a few years later. And so these pools have disappeared, they've been infilled. Um, but you also have a vegetation cover. So that's che that'll change the, the processes that are behaving. It may change the NFM benefits of the, of the system. So we need longer timescale studies, really, um, to go back to some of these sites and, and see what they're like um, some, some time in a sort of decadal time scale. And then, as everyone knows, the the really big challenge in terms of NFM is scaling up and getting quantification at the larger scales. So, so can we go to, you know, I've already made the argument that, that the sort of scale, this is again, this is Glossop, this is a flood, that's a relatively small catchment, it's less than 20 square kilometres. But when you scale up to this sort of event, this is a one in 50 year or higher event in, in Glossop in 2002. Um, what difference does the NFN interventions in the Glossop catchment make to those sorts of events? And to do that, of course, we're not going to be able to do that by direct measurement. We have to do that by, by modelling. Um, so it's about our ability to confidently model um, these sorts of events and the NFM, the way that NF interventions will, will change the, the peak flows here. Um, using the, the uh, small scale data to help calibrate and test those models and parameterize those models. So a couple of examples here, it's starting to happen. We've got the toolkit for, for this. We just need to roll out the modeling um, in, a, in a much more comprehensive way. So this is Dave Millage's work from uh, the Peak District. And what Dave did is he, he upscaled the data from our little experimental catchments here to uh, a, a nine square kilometer catchment. So again, it's not yet up to, to 20 square kilometers, but it's, 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 a, it's a larger catchment area. And, and do the benefits that we saw, do the reductions in flood peaks we saw in the micro catchment scale up to the larger catchment scale? And, and this is the model outputs and, the, and some of the, the, the headlines. In fact, that upscaling, there's still an effect so uh, of the different treatments, if you 
uh, just to take one of these statistics, if you revegetate and gully block that area that's badly eroded, um, then you could reduce peak discharges um, for the larger events at the, at the nine square kilometre scale by about eight percent. So we're getting to the point where we're getting meaningful, meaningful quantifications. And another study just to, to, um, to illustrate this, this is a scale up again. So this is Gao's work on modelling the Coverdale catchment based on if you uh, reintroduce sphagnum moss to the areas where it's bare peat, and in particular, if you located that sphagnum moss in the optimal location, the riparian zones, where it can intercept the most overland flow. Um, and the neat thing about this is it's, it's done to a, a defined um, return period event, so to, to a one in 10 year rainfall event. And there's really quite significant, the predictions of, of the reductions in peak flows are really quite significant for an 84 square kilometre catchment. Uh, you know, a 15% decrease is being predicted from this modelling approach. Um, so that looks, you know, really promising, but it's a single case study. At the moment, the case studies we've got are, are limited. They're limited at sites. The parameter based sets there are largely based on plot scale studies rather than smaller catchment studies. And we need to build what's happening now is we're building up confidence in these predictions by um, repeating them for, for a range of catchment types range of different, different sizes and uh, linking very much to the data on, on small micro catchment scales um, to gain greater confidence in the, in, the, in the performance of these models. So just to finish off, um, the, you know, the, the, re the review really is a sort of staging post in our understanding about NFM in peat and catchments. It reinforces some of the findings, for instance, of things like the Dadson review and so on, showing that, that, and that um, these peatland restoration measures are increasingly demonstrating that they can reduce peat flows at the small catchment scale. And even at that scale, we've got community at risk um, at, that, at that scale. So, but there's lots of uncertainties, of course. There's uncertainties in, in, in all the different types of restoration that we've got. There's uncertainties in in the upscaling, there's uncertainties in the timescales. Um, but we've got uh, approaches now, modern approaches are starting to, to coalesce to allow us to make much wider scale assessments. Um, and there's a set of ongoing projects, uh, including Protect, but also the ICAS project at the University of Leeds, Myers on the Moors out of Extra and so on, that are helping to address the uncertainties and knowledge gaps. And we expect to see quite a lot of progress over the next uh, two or three years on 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 these these issues, unsurprisingly, and um, can't finish without talking about Protect a little bit. So Protect is 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 doing that. It's a project which is pairing empirical evidence building of the impact of particular restoration types, particularly gully blocking and sphagnum uh, reintroduction, two of the really important um, techniques at the moment more empirical evidence at the small catchment scale about their effects, and then twinning those with modelling approaches to provide larger scale assessments for, for catchments at risk, in this case, in the, in the greater uh, Manchester area. OK, so I'll finish there. The last thing I'm just going to do is just say that this report is available. It's uh, the, the Commission of Inquiries is, is continuing, and the, the summary report from the whole Commission of Inquiries is expected sometime this year. But the, the technical reports of which this is one are available now, they can be downloaded either from the Manchester portal or from the IUCN's own website. And I think Gerard's put a link to that in um, on the, the web pages for, for this webinar. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, great. OK, so thanks very much for his attention and um, over to questions. Great. Th thanks very much, Tim. Um, yeah, well, thanks to people who been asking questions on the chat and Emma's been busy answering a number of those. We're also sent some questions beforehand when people registered. So perhaps I'll, I'll start with one of those. Please do continue to ask questions. Um, we'll cover as many as we can in the time remaining. Um, one question was, how were the discrete locations for NFM measures restoration chosen amongst the blanket areas? <laughs> OK, so um, there's a sort of changing emphasis here, I think. So 
up to now, the, um, the sort of conservation agencies who've been carrying out the restoration have really targeted areas where degradation is most severe. So you 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 go to the the location where there's been most, um, you know, the most gulling or the bare peat, you know, the really and. But there's been a kind of shift of emphasis, particularly with the realisation of the NF, potential NFM benefits of, of restoration, and can you optimise those? So um, an example of that is, 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 is the work showing that exactly where you plant sphagnum will, will matter. So if you plant sphagnum in the riparian zones around flow lines, that will have a more pronounced effect than if you plant sphagnum on, on hill slopes. And that's helping to direct um, conservation um, measures. And then a, a really nice example of, of thinking about optimising locations is, is more to the future, who've just done a big piece of work with um, Dave Millage from, from Newcastle on optimising the location of gully blocks. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna spend money putting in 8,000 gully blocks the South Pennines, where are the most effective places to put those gully blocks? And using GIS and terrain analysis techniques to do that. So the, 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 the short answer is, it's tended to, up to now, it's tended to, be, to take place in the areas where the damage was most, was most obvious, but it's being refined all the time. Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, Nick, Chapel, who um, is uh, the, the lead for the QNFM project, another one of the three projects making up the programme, uh, said he's, he was enjoying a talk and um, he asks, when revegetating peatlands, are some acceptable in bracket species better than others at enhancing wet canopy evaporation losses during storms and so reducing stream peak flows by this means? Okay, so yeah, that's the. <laughs> of course, it's Nick. It's going to be a good question. Um, <laughs> um, so, so one of the things is is again a lot of the revegetation that's been done to date has been driven by the necessity about how you re-establish re vegetation on these areas of bare peat. And the technique that that, that, that works has been proved to work. Is the first thing you do is that you you lime seed fertilize and you put brash down and you you, you actually get. Um, what's called a nurse crop growing. So it's, it's utility, utility grasses, the sort of things that wouldn't normally grow in the in the uplands, the sort of thing that you normally find on the golf course. And then once that stabilizes the peat and becomes established, because you put heather brash in there and because you've got pockets of native vegetation around, it recolonizes with with native species, with with particularly with cotton grass and and also heather where you've put the brash down. So um, a lot of the areas that have been uh, revegetated on bare peat so far have got some combination of um, nurse crop hanging on, things like agrostis and, and those sort of grasses, but then with eriophorum and heather. So to throw it back at, at, at Nick, um, what we need to know therefore is in these, in, these, in these areas where we've got particularly either dwarf shrub or we've got eriophorum sedge, but also got the got the possibility here of reintroducing sphagnum. How do those three vegetation types respond in terms of evapotranspiration and are most effective in terms of the processes that you're talking about? So it's unresolved, but it's a it's um, something that we need to look at now. We've got this um, these areas that have been restored with with this vegetation. Thank you. Um could lead to further discussion with Nick. Um, another question sent in before uh, beforehand was uh, much of the discussion and research in this area is about deep peat, more than 50 centimetres deep. Uh, I'd be interested to hear of evidence for the role of shallow peat in this function. Yeah, that's that's really important because um, I mean, some of the maps I, sh I showed deep peat is only a, a fraction of the total peaty soils and also you know not all even the the um the deep peat shown on a lot of these soils maps is not all the same and some of it can be quite shallow 50 60 70 centimeters or so um there has been more work done in peat, deep peat than, than than shallow peat but there has been work on shallow peat starting to emerge and the most interesting study perhaps is the one by the university of exeter by 
Richard Brazier and colleagues um, on uh, the Mars on the Mars project, which are shallow peatland systems, and and they were ditched. And interestingly, what they find is that is that one of the the differences in the shallow peat system is is much more co connectivity between surface flow and channels and um, routes into the subsurface mineral soil mineral material groundwaters. So after restoration, in fact, they find they find um, a storage effect, quite a large storage effect um, associated with the restoration. And the hypothesis is that's because it's a shallow system and it's better connected to the underlying the underlying material. Um, so there are really interesting differences. Um, uh, some of which we, we we probably understand, some of which we probably haven't fully quantified and don't understand enough. So more work on shallow peat systems is definitely warranted. Okay, thank you. Um, another one is, um, what are the key blockers to peatland restoration and how have these been overcome? Um, okay, so... Uh, most of the key blockers, I think, the, the, the simple answer to that is it's it's money, <laughs> it's finances. And one of the remarkable things about for those of us who've been involved in peatland research um, for you know twenty years or so is that twenty years or so people like Richard Lindsay were talking about peatland systems being the Cinderella egg system that people were not aware of that they were undervalued. Um, I don't think you can argue that now. I think the 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 um, one of the reasons why peatland restoration has become so prevalent and the investment is going in is because the case has been made so effective about their importance for for climate regulation um uh, biodiversity um and so on so so in fact say like on its head compared to some other forms of of um intervention and and and, and nfm there's you know, there aren't there's been fewer blockers probably on um, on large scale peatland restoration than than you might expect. Going forward, I think it still is to some extent it it is it is money, and to some extent it's also um, the fact that a lot of uh, a lot of sources of investment are tied to uh, single ecosystem service benefits. You know, so the Environment Agency have got responsibility for, for flooding, naturally they've got a different responsibility, DEFRA have got a, a, a different sort of overview. So if, if money's available for, for, for climate, for flood regulation, for water quality, sometimes it's difficult to, to make the case about why multiple benefits, the multiple benefits you get from peatlands should should um, should draw on those 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 parts. But um, it's remarkable how how much investment there has been. You know, so um, uh, I think those, those those blockers are probably less prevalent than they used to be. Sorry, I, I muted myself. There was a helicopter outside my window. I'll start again. Um, yeah, so just saying that we, we, we've probably just got time for one more um, question. It's quite a broad one, but um, is it possible to have it all? Do NFM conservation and landscape all want the same thing, or are there trade-offs in terms of what, how the interventions for NFM need to be structured in order to work effectively? Okay, yes, it's another good question. I, I, th I think another... To refer back to my last answer, another reason that peatland restoration has, has had so much buy-in and investment is because you can make a case that very largely, to use the, the words of the of the question, you can kind of have it all. You know, there are benefits of restoration for carbon, for for uh, biodiversity and for uh, water regulation. However, when you get to the detail with natural flood management, I think there are, there are some, uh, Terrible echo now. So apologies for that. Um, that some of the decisions about whether to optimise uh, interventions for, for, uh, for instance, carbon and water tables against whether you optimise for, for NFM, both will benefit um, from, for instance, um, some of the uh, 
optimised um, NFM measures that we see, for instance, dams with, with pass-throughs, they can lead to increases in water table and NFM benefits, but but you're going to you're going to limit the water table recovery that you find in there in order to provide the storage for, for NFM. So there are decisions to be made. It's it, it is um, you know potentially it's win win, but but you you might need to make decisions about whether you optimise restoration for a particular ecosystem service or not. Um, and we're getting to that point in our understanding where we can we can provide information on those potential on those potential uh, decision points. I think you're, you're, you're muted still, still, Gerard. Sorry, it was, sorry, it was very noisy outside the window. That's why I did that. Um, yeah, so yeah, thanks. That's all the time we've 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 got um, available now. Um, so just to say, can can you see my screen? Am I sharing my screen? Yes, good. Somebody's nodding. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks to Tim. Thanks to Emma. Um, and Emma, hope you get get well soon. Um, thanks to everyone for joining. Um, the next. Um, if you do have any feedback and follow-up questions, please do email us and um, we'll, we'll get back to you. There was a few questions we didn't have time to get to, so um, Emma and Tim have said they'll um, they'll answer those and we'll, we'll add a written note to the, to the web the web page um, where also the recording will be available. Um, the next webinar um, is on the 20th of August um, and it's Dr. Salim Guzari and um Guzarzi, I'm sorry i probably pronounced that wrong and david milledge from uh, the university of newcastle again on the from the protect team and they'll be talking about uh, numerical assessment of the impact of nfm practices in headwater blanket peatlands um just a quick plug for our newsletter please do sign up on the website for that if you, we, we do that we send that out um three or four times a year, um, up, update you on the research and some of the work of partners as well. And if, you, if you're signed up to that, we'll also keep you in touch with um, our, our, our webinars. We've also got the usual sort of social media. Do sign up to do uh, follow us on Twitter. Um, we'll keep you updated there as well. Um, so thanks again. Thanks for joining us. Hope we'll see you um, for the next webinar and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Bye then.